and we're going to start our recording. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, my name is Eddie Chavez Calderon here with uh, Uriel Etzetic and partnership as well with our friends from Arizona Jews for Justice. We are happy that all of you are joining us on, on, on this great event with our, our, our great friend, Professor David here, who is joining us. Uh, we, we are so happy. And Rabbi Shmuley here is with us as well. Hi, Rabbi Shmuley. Hi, folks who are just jumping on. So happy to see everybody. Let's go ahead and get this uh, get this started. I'm going to introduce uh, Professor David Weitzner, has a PhD in an MBA. Uh, and he is at heart a philosopher who briefly became a, uh, became a music industry executive and has now spent nearly two decades as a professional of strategy. He is the author of Connected Capitalism, how Jewish wisdom can transform work and fit, uh, fit 15 paths on how to turn out noise, turn on imagination and find wisdom. David's uh, research focuses on the intersection of business, ethics, strategy, and stakeholder theory. His writing has been featured in top academic journals, as well as in popular media outlets as diverse as the tablet magazine, the forward, and, and the conversation. Friends, I'm so excited to be here and introduce our, our great friend here, Professor David Weitzner. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much for being here. Professor, go ahead, uh, give us a little bit of grounding on, on your book, on, on, on your life. Um, uh, help us uh, start off here, this great conversation. Amazing. First of all, thanks so much for having me. Uh, I'm going to say sorry. Rabbi Shmoli is a, a personal hero of mine because when I was fighting the lonely fight a long time ago around Rubashkin, and immigrant rights and worker rights and, and, and that whole fight. I was a very lonely voice here in Canada. And I thought I was a very lonely voice in the US as well. And I was following what Rabbi Shmuley was doing, which was so brave and so amazing. And so it's really an honor, Rabbi Shmuley, to uh, connect with you here and have this event because you, you've really been a light, mamish, really, really a light, like Marie Lutzetic is called. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, my Misa, my story. <laughs> here's, a, here's a short version, the best way to say it. Uh, Professor David, I think we lost you for a second here. Uh oh, we might be having a little bit of connection issues. Eddie, why don't you bounce him out and, and maybe he'll come back? Can you can you bounce him out? Sorry, everybody. Yeah, let me let me see. Sorry, oh, friend. Looks like Professor David had some technical difficulties here. Hmm. Oh, yeah, looks like he's he exited and he's trying to reconnect right now. Sorry, friends. For those of you who just jumped on, we had some technical difficulties with uh, Professor David. Uh, I, I I apologize for the, the little snafu. Huh? We're we're working on getting him online again. Give us a quick second. They're getting you back, David. <laughs> really? It's working for everyone. Mm -hmm. Although he's been doing work on it already. I mean, he's been meeting with them. Thank you for everybody's patience. We're just trying to make sure that we have, um, oh, okay, yeah. Professor David said he's, he's trying to get into a better place with better connection. So give us a, a couple of seconds here. Um, while we're on here, I'm gonna take the advantage of sharing our, our summer fellowship upcoming. Uh, if any of you know uh, a rising Jewish leader that wants, uh, wants to really dive into social justice and, and, and dive into, into some great Torah, uh, let us know. We're doing a rapid, a really rapid in-depth um, summer fellowship. I'm going to post in the comments here um, the link to apply. It does come with an honorarium, and you're going to be able to join and learn with some of the greatest uh, Jewish thinkers, some, some amazing activists. He, 
um, and be able to participate together. There is an honorarium that we'll be able to share with everybody. I'm going to post it here in the comments. So if you know anybody, a, a rising Jewish leader, please send them this link uh, to apply for Ariel Aesthetic Summer Fellowship. We'd be more than happy uh, to have some great folks. Here is um, here he is. Uh, there you go. Let's see if Professor David has a better connection now. Better? Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you. Okay. I moved to a better location for uh, Wi-Fi. I apologize for that, folks. Technology, what are you going to do? <laughs> okay. So a little bit of background. Let's do this. Um, my last book was 15 Paths. And 15 Paths was described as the journey of a disillusioned business professor who sought out artist heroes to help me figure out what's wrong with capitalism, what's wrong with business, what are we doing wrong? And so I spent time talking to folks like Lee Ronaldo of Sonic Youth, Nels Klein of Wilco, other artist heroes. And they pushed my thinking and they let me see that the answers aren't gonna be found necessarily amongst the CEOs and the managers, but amongst the entrepreneurs and the people on the ground. And I had an event in New York City with them, with Lee and Nels. And we were talking about the fact that folks today don't have a sense of wonder anymore. They don't know how to connect. And one of the things that Nels said that struck me is he said, the way we used to connect as a culture would be in church. He said, we'd come to church, we'd sing, we'd chant, we wouldn't argue, and we'd reach this ecstatic state. And I said, you know, that's really beautiful as a, as a Jewish person. Uh, we have something similar, you know, uh, in the Hasidic world, there's something called a farbrengen, where we sit around and we drink and we sing and we bring up the energy and it's really inspiring and it empowered me. And I said, you know what, why am I being shy about the Jewish roots of my ideas? You know, really what inspires me is my Judaism and I've been bringing it to the classroom, to the boardroom for over 20 years. And so that was the inspiration behind this book, Connected Capitalism. This book said, you know what, I'm going to go full on out there. And I'm going to admit that even though I'm a strategist, and even though I find inspiration in the real business world, it's Jewish ideas that motivate me. And the heart of the book is this. It's, it's an idea from my, um, one of my mentors by the name of Reb Zalman Shachter Shalomi. He was a personal mentor, big influence in my life. And he always explained that the spiritual side of Judaism has three pillars. There's meaning, something sort of like the head, if you will. There's connection which is the heart. And there's a sense of wonder, the spirit, there's something that goes beyond all of it, beyond the rational. And so this book is based on the idea that if we take these three pillars of meaning, connection, and wonder seriously, we can save capitalism. If we approach business thinking about meaning, connection, and wonder, we can do amazing things both practically and spiritually. And so the book looks at uniquely Jewish ideas that come out of this to help raise up capitalism. You know, there's two ideas that are big in the book that I'll share. Uh, one is the idea of mitzvah. So I define mitzvah as a moment of doing that creates a space for being, a transformative moment, a transformative space for being with other people. And I use this idea of mitzvah because I said it's, it's very much different, very much in contrast with mainstream thinking on spirituality and business. Mainstream thinking looks at mindfulness. Mindfulness is all about being, and there's nothing wrong with mind. Mindfulness is a beautiful tradition. I have a meditation practice now going on 30 years. It's wonderful. But when we think about business, business is about taking action. And the idea of mitzvah, which is getting out there, getting your hands dirty, and changing the world through doing, I think is a very powerful idea. The other idea that I bring into the book that has explicitly Jewish roots is this notion of chavrusa. So chavrusa in Judaism is an idea of learning pairs, but it's so much more than that because when we look at what a chavrusa is, we have new ideas, I think, about how to work together in the business world. So what's a chavrusa? Number one, chavrusa means no hierarchy. If someone's a rabbi and a renowned teacher, and they're in a chavrusa with a student. They're equals in that moment. In the chavrusa relationship, there's no hierarchy because when we want to work together in an innovative way, we have to come together as equals. So I think that point is very important. In a chavrusa relationship, you listen 
as closely as you speak. There's always a back and forth. And I think that's something very important for the business world. But I think most importantly is the root of the word itself. So chavrusa means friend. And I think we're scared to bring the language of friendship into the business world. And quite frankly, I think the best innovations happen when we use the language of friendship. Because if we really want to innovate, we have to push each other. And when we push each other, we might say things that are harsh, that are critical. But if we're friends, we'll say it with a spirit of love and we'll feel safe and we'll work harder. But if we're not friends, if there's that hierarchy, if it's a boss yelling at a subordinate, or if it's somebody you know, who controls your paycheck and your future and your ability to put bread on the table, and they're criticizing you, it's gonna come from a very different space. So these are some of the main ideas, and, and I think they have a lot of application. You know, I just wrote an article recently uh, that's gotten a lot of traction that says, post-pandemic, when we think of rebuilding after the pandemic, we're gonna have to figure out how to get eye contact back, to, back into the picture. And we're gonna have to figure out how to rebuild trust, because after all these years of the year and a half of Zoom meetings, where we're not connecting face-to-face, -face, our bodies, are forgetting how to trust. When I see Eddie here via the screen, it's not the same as if I'm sitting in a room with him, looking him in the eye and building that trust. And so one of the things I said in the article was that there are two ways to fix this. And they're both rooted in the idea of Chavrusa. One is we gotta use the language of friendship explicitly. If our bodies can't be tricked into friendship through verb, nonverbal cues, eye contact, body language, then we have to say it. I have to say, Eddie, buddy, <laughs> my friend, right? That's the only way to still build that relationship. The other idea is to push trustworthiness as opposed to trust. What's the difference? Trust is the smoothing mechanism in a relationship. Trust is I'm going to do this and then you're going to do this and I'm going to do this and you're going to do this. And then over time, that relationship will get better because we'll each be doing things to build trust. Trustworthiness is one-sided. Trustworthiness says I want to project then I'm not gonna take advantage of you. I'm gonna put out there to people I haven't even met yet that I'm someone who can be trusted. And that's a spiritual idea. It's a very spiritual idea because it means making yourself vulnerable. It means taking a risk. It means putting yourself out there. And so I think there really is a lot in Jewish wisdom that we can bring to the table. But like I said to Eddie, I'm not big on yapping even though I'm a professor. I would love this to be a conversation. So please, if any of you folks have questions, thoughts, Let's get into this. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So let's start with um, what would you identify as the greatest vices, vices of capitalism as it exists today um, that you're trying to uproot or address? You know, so I had a great schmooze that's in the book with David Frum. Whatever you think of him, I have a lot of respect for him as an individual. And one of the things that we talked about in the book is I said his battle with the Republican Party, in my mind, is similar to my battle to defend capitalism. Why? Again, staying outside of politics, you know, but the problem he identified in the Republican Party was twofold, but related. One is the greed and selfishness. And the second is not thinking for the future, right? It's related. You're greedy, you're selfish, and therefore you do with it. So why don't, in his mind, why don't Republicans jump on environmental issues, which he thinks should be a nonpartisan concern? Because they don't care about their grandchildren, right? They care about right now. And so I think those are the biggest vices. The biggest vice is saying, I'm greedy. What does greed mean? The way I define greed in my work is claiming so much that other people can't get their fair share. So to me, if you're making $100 million, but everyone in your firm is also making millions, that's not greedy. Greedy is when you're making $100 million and folks in your firm are making minimum wage, right? So I think that's number one, greed, which is taking so much and not sharing. And I think two is the short-termism, not thinking about the future. So not taking environmental concerns seriously, not thinking about sustainability, not thinking about you know even what sort of society we're building, what we're doing to the population. I think those are, really, really critical issues. And, you know, even though I don't lean in the same direction as David from politically, what I loved about having the conversation with him is I love founding, finding sort of a, a point of entry between someone whose political view 
is different than mine. I, I found it encouraging to know that there are people on the left, there are people on the right, there are people on the center who can all be allies in recognizing that we need to put an end to this era of selfishness, greed, short-termism, environmental irresponsibility, worker exploitation, that these can be issues that surpass political dis distinctions. So it's interesting. So maybe I'll share one more question and then I'd love to open it up to others as well. But um, it seems to me like part of the assimilation of the American Jewish community is into the idea that Shabbos is where you're religious, right? It's like, if the mitzvah matters, the mitzvah is in the workplace, the mitzvah is everywhere. And so to break from the partisan divide of like, how do you view regulation, tax regulation, or how do you view capitalism from a left right wing divide? If we think of work as avodat Hashem, right? Work is service, work is about tikkun midot, it's about a repair of character, then we can find a common ground perhaps, where, like you said, thinking of mitzvah, thinking of chavrusa, thinking in these kind of categories, we can think like, my religious life is not when I'm just davening, my religious life is when I'm at work. And so what, is the, what does that ask of me? What does the Torah ask, what does the Torah ask of me when I'm at work? Right? I agree, I agree 100%, you know, again, there's great beauty and wisdom in the Buddhist tradition. So when I, when I show how this is different, it's not to knock, right? But folks who self-identify as Jews, make no mistake, our religion is not an aesthetic religion. We are not monks. We don't privilege. Again, very beautiful to be a monk. That's not our religion. So when I meet a Jew who, as Shmuley says, knows how to wrap tefillin every day, every morning, wrap themselves in the towels in the morning, be really devotional, and then go out to work and take advantage of their employees, take advantage of the environment, take advantage of their neighbors. That's not Judaism. That's not our religion. And you know, what's very, very interesting to me, there's nothing good about COVID. There's nothing good about the lockdowns. But an interesting lesson I have seen is when you take away shul for some people because of the lockdowns, how suddenly their Judaism falls apart. Because for them, hey, I go to synagogue on Saturday, I pray that's my Judaism. Well, now I can't go to synagogue. So where am I expressing my Judaism? And their challenge for, for someone like us, it's not a challenge. Our Judaism is in everything we do, every moment of our lives. But for some folks whose Judaism was so centered around the physical space of the synagogue, they didn't know how to bring that holiness into their day-to-day -day life. And, and, and that's really, I think, I hope that post-COVID, we recognize that the holiness and the spiritual effort has to be in every, every part of our lives. Thank you. On this concept of, 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 of capitalism, uh, what do you say to the people who are like fighting for wage equity and say that for us to have wage justice, you need to shut, completely shut down capitalism? Right. So, so I'll be completely candid with you and say, you know, when we published this book, there was a lot of back and forth over the title because to many capitalism is itself a dirty word. And so my starting point is I will grant what every critic has to say about capitalism and the sort of working economic system that I'm arguing for will take as its starting point whatever you say. So maybe what I'm arguing for in my book, you won't even say it's capitalism at the end of the day because you're right, it, it, it starts with co-creation, not management. You know, it's one of the things that I really, really push. I think the era of management is over. The era of, um, usually a male, <laughs> right, in charge of resources, of people, of money, and saying, that's my job. My job is to go out and control the money and control the people. That's over. You know, the future is co-creation. You know, there's a study that came out that Deloitte did, which is fascinating, that said it's two pieces of the study that I find really interesting. The first is that 90% of millennials, the vast majority of millennials, will not just work for money. If they feel that the corporation they're working for doesn't have ideals that resonate with them, that, that, that can't be trustworthy, that doesn't do good, that doesn't pursue a social mission, they'll leave. Number two, within the next decade, millennials are gonna be something like 70% of the workforce. So change is coming, <laughs> you know, the era of running a business from a command and control perspective is over. Maybe not tomorrow, you know, might take five years, 10 years, but co-creation is the future. And I think, you know, the, the, the question 
of a living wage will not be a question anymore. I think hopefully folks are recognizing that there has to be a recognition that everybody matters. Again, another lesson of COVID, nothing good about COVID, but if there's another lesson of COVID, it's in this idea of the essential worker, right? The folks who are often paid the least are the most critical. And moving forward, if we want our businesses to be healthy, we can't have anyone paid the least. We have to view everyone across the hierarchy as partners in co-creation and make sure, really make sure that they feel empowered. So, you know, some of you might listen to this and say, ah, you're just being an apologist for capitalism. And I would say, no, I, I wanna change capitalism, but what I'm fighting for, why do I still use the word capitalism. I use the word capitalism because for me, and again, I'm happy to be challenged on this. For me, I don't trust government more than I trust CEOs. So when I embrace the word capitalism, I'm saying there should be free markets where individuals who aren't in the government make some decisions. And those decisions obviously need to be more ethical than they are right now. But, but Eddie, I completely agree with the critics and that critique that you offered. Thank you. Oftentimes we see that there is a like a very deep, uh, almost like a dehumanization of saying that folks that are in the power of, 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 of wealth are, are less than human beings, right? That just because folks have access to that wealth and power, that they need to be brought down, right? How do you challenge that trope of, of not being able to dehumanize people, of, of attacking the systemic issue rather than the person? Yeah, you know, an idea that I push in the book, and this is also where I find allyship with, with David Froman comes out in that chapter in this discussion, that elite in and of itself is not a dirty word. We've happened upon a point in society where we think that by itself, the notion of elite is dirty. Wielding power is not necessarily an evil thing. Power sometimes has to be necessary, but it's how you wield the power, what you do as a power. So I want to just say two things on this, right? That will give you hope. First thing I want to say is that there's even a recognition in the world of business that leadership needs to change. So Harvard Business Review, right, the, the publication that comes out of Harvard's business school. So one of the, if you will, old school, hardcore right wing capitalist institution has said that leadership isn't a trait. It's a relationship. What does that mean? That means leaders today recognize that it's a two way street. Their ability to lead is contingent on those who are quote unquote following them, willfully participating, what they bring to the table, what they give, okay? So in that sense, this CEO might still technically be an elite. That CEO, she might still be rich, but if her leadership is contingent on recognizing that everyone on her team is an equal, that we're co-creating together, that while there may be financial disparities, I'm trying to bring you up. My motivation is social mobility, right? Lifting you up, not just paying you a wage, then I think that we can recognize that in and of itself, it's not problematic. The other thing I want to share is, is a little bit more research on what power means. You know, we, we know that there's three types of power, well, four, but we'll talk about there's coercive power, there's instrumental power, normative power, right? So if I'm using my power coercively, saying, if you don't do what I say, I'm going to beat you, that person's evil, right? That's not an elite worth keeping. That person needs to be overthrown. Second category, instrumental, someone who has power because they're rich. So they say, because I'm rich, you're going to do what I want to say because I can pay you. It's a little better than beating you, still very aversive, right? The optimal form of power is what we call normative power, which is symbolic power, which is born of prestige, respect, et cetera. So if I'm an elite because I've worked my way to the top after 40 years in this company, I've shown I care about my community, I've shown that I've cared about my workers, I care about the company, that individual is to me a partner. And one of the things we talk about in the book with, with, with David Frum is, is in that world, we can pursue reform, right? And this is sometimes a debate. There's, there's a sense that we need a revolution in capitalism. And we do need a revolution if the elites are exploiting their power instrumentally, but perhaps we can reform, we can work together to change if there's elites who are using their power out of respect. Friends, questions? Friends, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. I'll keep it going. Uh, Wait, unless I, have a, I have a question. Go for it. 
sorry, let me start my video. I'm um, sorry. Oh God, I've got I've got my hair pulled up. So, you know, I am I I appreciate your talk, Professor, and I'm going to get your book and also get it for a couple of people in my family. You know, right now it's really hard being Jewish. I mean, because um, Israel is being projected onto all Jews, and all Jews are being projected onto Israel, and it's very complicated. But I also have run into situations where a lot of people have negative feelings toward Jews um, that based on one interaction with someone who happens to be Jewish, right? And they apply it across the board. Um, I, uh, I, I even have, uh, anyway. So the question that, that comes to, which is the Hasidic community, the black hats, the ones that are visibly Jewish, like. I think that if I were walking on the street, you wouldn't necessarily know I was Jewish, right? In America, in Europe is a different story. But we have these communities that are completely isolated and insular with evidence of racism toward black people with, with very disconcerting employment practices, yada, 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 all that kind of stuff. Um, why is it that in the reform community and other progressive communities, the idea of tikkun olam is outward. It's our job to repair the world for everyone. Um, but in the Hasidic community and the Orthodox and the ultra Orthodox, not the modern Orthodox that I grew up with, but but outside, um, uh, it's only to their own community. They don't see a need to help everyone get better. Sure. So, so let me let me answer this in, in two ways, Nancy. Yeah, so okay. the first thing I, I'm going to say is um, the Hasidic community is where my heart and soul is, believe it or not, despite my aesthetic. And, and I'm going to recommend that you look up a talk. I recently had a talk. It's posted online. You can find it on YouTube with a gentleman by the name of Rabbi Yisrael Bernath. He's a Chabad Hasid out of uh, Montreal. And he's known as the Love Rabbi. He did a special that's going to be on Netflix about sending folks up. And what he talks about a lot, and what we talk about a lot, is he's often othered because of his aesthetic. So because he has the long beard and he wears the black hat, you know, he, he's, he's viewed as somehow not progressive, not liberal. And he, he's, he is. His worldview aligns almost, I imagine, identically to your own on many of the important questions. So I think we have to be careful not to other folks, even within our community. Then I would say, once we recognize that they all are our brothers and sisters, despite their aesthetic, I personally believe in putting my efforts towards change from within the community. So I spend a lot of my efforts um, working with folks in the Hasidic community to try and inspire them to embrace um, a lot of the values that you've talked about. And, and what I think, again, I'm, I'm not an expert in this. All I can say is I have a lot of love for the Hasidic community. What I've seen on the ground is, unfortunately, uh, politics has permeated every aspect of our being. And just as there is a uniform uh, in the Hasidic community around a black hat and a beard, there started to become a uniform around Trumpism and Republicanism which I think is really unfortunate because they're a beautiful community, they're a spiritual community. And, and, I, and, and in embracing Trumpism, they've started to then other those who don't believe in that worldview, you know? So they started to suggest, well, Tikkun Olam is for the lefties, it's for the, it's for the progressives, it's not for us. And that's, that's inaccurate. I mean, we know that that's inaccurate from the perspective of the Torah. So I, I, would, I would suggest that the unfortunate interactions that you've had with the Hasidic community should not taint the wider view of the beautiful. No, it's not me. Yeah. I didn't mean to, and by the way, I'm, oh, a Jew, I'm a Jew of German descent. So we're all about othering everyone, East Europeans, <laughs> everybody else. So like I'm a hundred percent German on okay. the side of German descent. So, right. so I didn't mean to other, I didn't mean it to seem like I was othering them. Problem is, is that because they are identifiably Jewish, right? because they, they, they choose to wear clothing that identifies them of a particular type of Judaism. Like for example, at the beginning of the pandemic, the, um, 
that movie that that series that was so popular on Orthodox was I think that was that the name of it on Netflix and it was crazy because all these people were like oh that's what being Jewish is and I'm like no that's not what being Jewish is that's one particular type of practice affiliated with it but I'm curious though you just said in the Talmud the idea is that tikkun olam is to repair the greater world not just our world so I'm curious though where this practice and it's because Sorry, Lola's with me. I'm curious where this this isolation comes from. And also in Unorthodox, there was this great line about that particular sect. Basically, they decided to become incredibly insular because they had been in Germany. And like my ancestors that came to America in the 1840s, they stayed. And what, what good came of emancipation? What good came? So... Um, but but I'm curious why, I mean, that's what I'm looking at. How did this happen that we have these two very divided groups? So I'll, I'll, let me say something a little different. I heard there's a great story that uh, one of my mentors told me that when he would go to conferences um, for folks who were into uh, cross-cultural, cross-religious outreach, at the start of the conference, the Jews would sit with the Jews, the Christians would sit with the Christians, and the Muslims would sit with the Muslims. But by the end of the weekend, the right-wing folks of all religions will sit together, the liberal folks cross-religion will sit together, and the centrist folks cross-religions ended up sitting together. And I think that's a little bit the phenomena of what you're describing, because there are many Hasidic folks who are doing beautiful things right now. You know, if you look at Lubavitch in particular, I had a big fight, as I said, with I had a big fight with them over Rabashkin. Huge fight, and it's not an insubstantive fight. Big fight that they were supporting Rabashkin and not supporting workers' right. But you also look at all the good they do with Chabad houses across the world. They're reaching out, you know? So don't make the mistake that as right-wing folks gel together and you see a community of right-wing folks coming together in their Trumpist attitude, I think that has less to do with the religion and less to do with their cultural practices and their spiritual practices, and more to do with a particular political moment, probably rooted in fear. You know, I think there's a lot of fear going on, and 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 that's probably the way that they respond. Um, but have faith that your brothers and sisters across the religious spectrum um, are savable and are doing good and do have hearts. And 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 you know, just again, as as we're often other for being Jewish. Uh, we don't want to others, other others <laughs> within our community. So I get what you're saying, Nancy, I hear you. Um, and I hope that you can encounter more folks who wear the uniform that are doing the right thing. Um, because I think that that's really important. Thank you Thanks. so much. Yeah. Uh, you have another question here that was typed in. Do you think it's possible to have wage equity under the current economic capitalistic system? I do. I absolutely do. You know, believe it or not, the world is changing. There's incremental change. It's slow, but the world is changing. And, and, and I'll give you an example. You know, it used to be the case that when a big company like Amazon was offering to set up shop, the cities would almost, you know, fight each other to race to the bottom to bring them there. So they would say, you know, we'll offer you tax breaks. We'll give up part of our property. We'll do whatever you want to bring you here. And that's changed. We're seeing that on the ground right now. Right now, cities say, no, 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 we have what to offer. You know, New York, for example, right? New York now recognizes that folks want to live in New York and New York has great resources and great uh, potential employees. And so if you want to open up shop in New York, you got to sell it to us. And so that's a form of capitalism that we kind of imagined 30 years ago, right? That the power would be returned to the cities, to the people. So is wage equity something that can happen under a capitalist system? Absolutely, because our capitalist system is evolving. That's empirically verifiable and it's gonna to continue to evolve. And what it's going to require is our demanding it. So in my book, in the new one, Connected Capitalism, I interviewed someone by the name of Michael Solomon. He's a well-known consultant and author. He's, famous for the idea of the, the 10X leader. What's, what's that? The idea that there's certain employees, particularly in the tech sector, that if you hire them, they're as valuable as 10 other employees, right? And so what did he say? He said, you know, these folks won't work for the old command and control type of manager. They won't work for them. 
They will only work for somebody who understands the value in the human being. And they have principles and, 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 and adhere to values that are more communitarian, you know, and they recognize that exploiting workers is not the way of the future. So I am deeply optimistic that we can achieve wage equity within our lifetime. I think it's gonna still be a fight. I think we can demand it, but I think there's a recognition right now that being economically efficient, right? Trying to do things as cheaply as possible doesn't work. If I can just say one more point on this, you know, uh, one of the biggest lessons of the pandemic, particularly we felt this in Canada, right? Is that efficiency we now see as a dirty word. So why were, for example, Canadians behind in vaccinations compared to the US? Because we didn't have manufacturing facilities. Why did we shut down these vaccine manufacturing facilities? Because we said, well, it's efficient to let the US produce it. And then when we need it, we'll import it from the US. Now the crisis happens, supply chains break down, right? We're not getting the vaccines. So one of the lessons is this idea of efficiency that we can do the bare minimum, save money, exploit people, it's not the future. The future is gonna be redundancy. The future is gonna be human-centered employment. The future is gonna be livable wages, livable environments and co-creation. And uh, hopefully you'll be a part of that build. Anyone else? I've got more questions, but I'd love to hear if anyone else does first. Give me the toughest questions, I'm here, man. <laughs> If you okay. disagreed with anything I said, I'm ready to hear. How do, we address the, how do we address the fear? Let's say we brought Martin Buber into this, you know, and we tried to move from transactional relationships into I thou relationships where people were not means to our industrial ends, but were ends in themselves. And there's a fear because America is great. We are productive. We are cutting edge. We are efficient. Like, you know, and there's a fear that if we actually view people not as commodities, but as ends in themselves, that we will lose that edge. We will yeah. lose it. So what kind of data do we have from experiments or experiences in America that can show, can build trust that we will gain more than we lose, not just ethically, but um, collectively? The best data that we have on that topic is around innovation. That's the best data. So what do we know about innovation? We know that for people to be innovative, they have to have space to play. So in my book, I interview someone from Google, right? And he says that at Google, they only expect engineers to be productive three and a half days a week. In other words, they recognize that half the time, half the time, they're not being productive. They're playing, they're being free, right? And that's the creativity that supports the sort of innovative outcomes we want. Now, if that's the case, why isn't every firm Google? The reason every firm isn't Google is because there are still managers out there who are afraid to trust their employees, to give them the space to play, to give them the freedom to show up late, to know that that's part of productivity. But I'll say again, they're a, literally a dying breed. I mean, I hate to use that term, but it does seem to be a generational divide that there are older folks who still think that work means you punch the clock at 8.30 and you punch out at five, six, seven, whatever that is, and you come to the office and they watch you and they make sure you're there and they don't give you time off. There are still folks like that but they're retiring and leaving the industry and being replaced by younger folks who say, no, you know, I recognize that I have a life that goes beyond work and I'm a better worker because of it. You know, it's, it's something that Michael Solomon talked about as well. He said that, you know, the, the, the folks who still are afraid to empower individuals are being pushed out and that's a good thing. And so the best way to alleviate that fear is through experience. And I would encourage all managers and all CEOs and anyone who has anyone you know, beneath them to play with this idea, you know? See what happens in your workspace. Give your worker more leeway, supervise them less, be more flexible and time off and see the productivity that'll emerge. Uh, Google knows it, Apple knows it, right? The, the tech industry, they know it. And I think eventually it's gonna seep down into other industries as well. So the fear is rooted in economic inefficiency, the answer to that is innovation and the economic benefits that will come from that. I saw there was a texted question, but it's disappeared if you see yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and read it. Yeah. It's from our great friend, Judy here, who says, doesn't economic equity require the person or people who set the compensation structure to either identify with the employee 
Uh, and then she has another follow-up question. How does that happen without the leader being extraordinary in his or her humanity, either identifying with the employee or being extra extraordinarily farsighted? Yeah, so excellent question. And again, I think it's, it's the times are changing. You know, I, I used to make a joke when I started my professorial career 20 years ago that the reason I'm a professor is because I'll never be a good CEO. Why won't I be a good CEO? Because we had data 20 years ago. And 20 years ago said, what was the characteristics of a successful CEO? You ready for this? I'm sure you can guess. Successful CEO was tall, at least 6'3", white, and broad-shouldered. And that was a successful CEO. Why? Again, according to the data at the time, because both men and women, for different reasons, trusted a tall, broad-shouldered, white individual. That meant safety. I'm a short Jew, <laughs> not broad shoulder, so I can never be a CEO, right? That was the old thinking because, you know, it was a body type. That's gone, that thinking. You know, there's really a recognition right now that a good CEO is somebody who understands that leadership is a relationship and that leading means creating an environment for those who are with you to be brought up. And so there's a huge component of identification there. And I do agree with you that as a starting premise, the leader has to identify with those beneath them. But I think that more and more that is happening. I think as we push for more equity and diversity in the workspace, you're finding that the traditional hierarchies fall apart. And you're finding that folks taking on leadership roles do have that sympathy, do have that understanding, because quite frankly, it works better. Like I said, the data is there. Command and control, it doesn't work anymore. If you walk into a room and say, I'm tall and white and male and broad shouldered, follow me, you're gonna be laughed out of that room today. You know, 30 years ago, you were promoted. Today, you're gonna to be laughed out. So I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. No offense, by the way, to tall, white, male, now. you know, there'll still be a place for you, but not because of your body, because of your soul. <laughs> so thanks for that, Judy. I'm wondering, could you talk? Hi, Rick Feldman. Hi, Rick. So my, my son and I were talking about uh, Israel and the current crisis and the way Bernie Sanders would handle the crisis as opposed to Joe Biden. So I don't know if this is in your range of conversation, but I'm curious how, how Bernie Sanders is seen as the kind of intuitive open leader that, that will find a way through and, and Biden is seen as more of a politician of the old school. I want, I'm going to avoid, I'm going to be a coward and avoid political discussions, um, especially as a Canadian. But, I, but I'm going to say this, I'm going to say this, I'm going to say my worry of Bernie, of Bernie Sanders in this moment is, is I do think that we have to be unabashedly proud of our Judaism in this moment. I think that no matter our politics, we need to stand with our people broadly, broadly defined in this political moment. And I think that what's, you know, really frightening to me right now about what's happening in Israel is less what's happening in Israel and more, again, the othering that is happening abroad and the way that there's once again a fragmentation and, and the way the fight that is happening in Israel is being brought. Look, Right here in Toronto, I'll give you, you know, a personal example. So it was just the holiday of Shavuos. And for the first time ever, I told my kids they can't go to the park on the holiday because uh, Jews were being beaten up. Anyone who looked like a Jew was being attacked and beaten up. And so I, I really think that we need to come back to a place where we can have sensible disagreements with folks that can remain on the policy level and not be turned into identity politics, people, you know, Jews being attacked for being Jews. Um, I, I'm a Canadian, <laughs> so I'm not going to weigh in on, on, on Bernie versus Joe Biden. But I will say I, I do hope that we can talk sensibly through these positions. And I really hope that our leadership class can uh, get it together and, and, and write their own populace before we worry about the global questions. You know, like right now, Toronto is, is, is much more liberal 
than Arizona. You know, our, our prime minister is very liberal. And in our very liberal society, Jews are being beaten up on the street. And that's, that's problematic to me. That's antithetical to the type of liberal values that I hold. And so I, I do think the conversation has to come first about decorum and, and what we accept as a valid form of protest in a liberal society. And to me, violence is never a valid form of protest in a liberal society. That's why I've always been a fan of reform over revolution. Okay. Sorry, Rick, sorry for copping out. <laughs> oh, it's okay. I... Uh, uh, picking up on that last point, <clears throat> I think when many uh, turn to economic justice issues, they naturally don't know where to turn other than Marx. And Marx is such a great model in that he's a messianist. As, a, as like that's like probably the extent of his Jewishness. He cares about inequality, and he's a secular messianist in that he believes that a utopia can be achieved. But where Marx um, departs from Judaism, I think, is twofold. One is that Marx is it believes in violence. He believes in the Hegelian model that only a violent revolution will achieve the utopian model. And secondly, I think in that he's a materialist. Um, there is no soul or, or realm of ideas or a realm of culture. It's all about the money. It's all about uh, the wages. And I want so I wonder if you agree with that assessment in terms of um, the the two ways he's Jewish, and the two way uh, not that he's Jewish. I mean he's Jewish, but the two <laughs> ways. The two, I mean he I mean he's an anti semite. I mean he was an yeah. he was a big anti semite. He he said the Jews the Jews should be destroyed ultimately, right? But. But I wonder, like, how, is there another model? So first of all, what's your response to Marx? And is there another model from Enlightenment as an economist philosopher that you would point to who really set, who you think set the philosophical foundation for this conversation? Okay, so let me, let, and, and I want to tie back to Rick's question. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I want to bring it all together. And um, there's a beautiful, beautiful statement that uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs had. Uh, when Rabbi Jonathan Sachs was exploring the question of, of anti-Semitism, what did he say? He said, the reason Jews are always targets is because the folks who attack Jews are folks who are afraid of change. And Jews are always the forefront of change. Jews are capitalists, Jews are social. That's why I like your Bernie Sanders example, right? Because Netanyahu is Jewish. Bernie Sanders is Jewish, right? We have Jews on the right, we have Jews on the left. We have Jews who are capitalists, we have Jews who, who are anti-capitalists. And so, you know, Rabbi Sachs made the observation that because we are always on the forefront of change, we will always be attacked by those who don't want the change that is coming. Now, in my mind, the Jewish response to that is Chavrusa. The Jewish response to that is debate within the context of love. So, you know, if I can come back to Nancy's question earlier, right? Nancy may be surprised to learn that I went through the Dafyomi cycle, the seven year Dafyomi cycle in Yiddish in a Hasidic stable, okay? With someone whose politics I, I do not share at all, with someone whose aesthetic, as you can tell, is very different than my own, right? But I really enjoyed learning with him over those seven years because we disagreed on everything, because we disagreed on everything. And so that we can come together in a safe space and argue over everything. It was really beautiful. It was really beautiful. And, you know, Rav Shmuel, you asked me the question of the philosopher who I think has it right. My intellectual hero is, is the American pragmatist Richard Rorty. I think Richard Rorty got it right because Richard Rorty was an arch progressive an arch liberal, right? But he said, at the end of the day, it's all about conversation. Rorty recognized that we have to give up on this notion of truth, not because there isn't truth, but because truth is a conversation stopper. So the minute I say I'm right because I have the Torah and you're wrong, the minute we argue over whose book is right, we're not gonna go anywhere. Not because I don't think my book is right. I think my book's right, but you also think your book's right. And so that's not a conversation, right? A conversation, is when we can exchange ideas and grow together and we're open to that. And Rorty did say, you know, some debates will only be settled by who has a bigger gun, unfortunately, right? That might be true of what's happening in Israel. Maybe, sadly, scarily, it's gonna be decided either way through violence. But the hope is, the hope is that we can work together 
through conversation and grow and change. And I think Richard Rorty, you know, is somebody who, who everyone needs to read today because all of his ideas have fallen deeply, deeply out of favor. You know, the notion, you know, there, there's two things that I love in Rorty. Rorty says that he thinks the biggest mistake progressives made, and he was writing this in the 80s. He said, the biggest mistake progressives made is that they gave up on spirituality and they gave up on, um, <clears throat> on, on pride in their country. He said they ceded that to the right. And he said, you know, the, the best hope we have is to re-embrace the prophetic religious tradition. The best hope we have is to once again be patriotic and to be proud of our country and use that to push progressive values. Rick, shoot back, man. If you disagree, I, I want to hear. <laughs> oh, I, I, <laughs> well, I, I really do agree with, with that idea of conversation. I, I was... I was listening to a, a report from, on I-24, the station from Israel or, or international news. And one fellow was fighting, you know, very strongly that uh, about the truth, um, you know, that uh, the Jews are not, uh, that Palestine is, is a victim here. And there was a fellow from the right who's, who says he's running for president of Israel. I don't know all these names. I don't follow those stuff so closely. But he was saying, I believe in conversation you know, and that we have to have a conversation and it was uh, uh, with everyone and there was, it, it, you know, it was, it was hard to get past that truth idea that was so, you know, this is, this is the only way it can be. And so this idea of the and and the both and bringing in each end and having, uh, being able to carry both ends of the, of the talit and keep on talking about it and at least, you know, keep on working through issues in a conversation is, is, is clearly a, in my way of thinking, uh, you know, the way to go. And I also, you know, having gone through the Omer period and connecting so deeply to uh, this idea of compassion and justice and finding those two as what is really holy is that conversation about how do we balance compassion and justice in the context of, of, a, of, of our, our idea of God and and um, and and you know I mean I think these ideas for me if each person in the world internalized just that you know that that um, they were, and, and especially the leadership <laughs> we'd have we'd have a, a world where you could find our way to peace and we'd have a world where we could find our way to to, to uh, you know to to being able to take care of those that don't have but it just seems like. And maybe this is, you know, this Richard Rory, I, it just seems like the world doesn't really want to find peace and find compassion, ultimately. That piece of greed, that piece of control, that piece of whatever it is that's got us all, that's, got, that's, that's just pulling us all apart seems to in the, that, I don't know. I, I yeah, wish I was yeah. optimistic about it as you, as far as, as far as the future and this generation being able to work it out. You know, one of the things Rorty said, we're going to talk, let's talk, we got distracted, we're going with Rorty, but he's such an inspiration to me, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to push on it. One of the beautiful things that, that Rorty said, again, as a progressive, is he said, the biggest mistake liberal societies make is when we stop being ethnocentric and try to be universal instead. Why is that a mistake, right? Because again, and this is the heart of my book, I'm Jewish, I'm going to come to the table using Jewish language. You're a Christian, you come to the table with Christian language. You're Muslim, you come to the table with Muslim language. And that's where we're gonna have the interesting conversations, right? The interesting conversations when we remain ethnocentric, where we say, I love my tradition, but I wanna learn about yours. I wanna hear about yours. I wanna know about yours, right? And, and that, he said, is a real liberal society. That's when we're truly coming together. Not when we're trying to all whitewash and, and, and you know, take away the beauty of our tradition to try and say the same thing. No, 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 in fact, let's be different. And let's celebrate our differences and try to reach points of consensus. And, and, and I think that that's, that's missing today. You know, Rav Zalman, my mentor, he used to say that in his mind, religions are best understood as the metaphor of a heavenly body. And each religion serves a different function in the body. So one religious tradition might be the heart, one might be the liver, one might be the hand. We all approach it different, but we're all required 
for this godly body that all comes together. And, and uh, I'm going to say this too. I know that a lot of what I say sounds um, naively optimistic, but I'll repeat my resume. You know, I'm a hard nosed business strategy guy who's <laughs> in the business, you know, schools for 20 years and consulted with CEOs. And I have hope, you know, I truly, I live with hope. I see things are changing. The next generation is different. Folks are becoming more open-minded. Uh, there's less of a tolerance for economic inequality. And, and, and I am optimistic. And, you know, to, to your last point, Rick, you know, it's funny. Uh, it's ironic. So on Shavuos, I stayed up with my son. He's 14. And we were debating, what should we learn? Should we learn some Gemara? And he was like, no, you know what, Daddy? I'd like to learn something a little more philosophical. So I picked out, there's a beautiful book by Abraham Joshua Heschel, where he looks at the Hasidic tradition of the Baal Shem Tov, which emulated love, and the Hasidic tradition of the Kutzker, who pushed justice and righteous anger. And the book is him going through the role, not quite a dialectic, right? But really the role each of these play in our spirituality. And I think it's important to recognize that we can come to a place that is authentic, that is beautiful, that is inspiring, that doesn't sacrifice either. We need not sacrifice justice for love. We need not sacrifice love for justice. You know, we can, we can have both. Shmuel, you disagree? <laughs> no, not at all. But I would love for you to give kind of your closing thought. So, and then we'll wrap up here. This has been yeah. so great. Beautiful. So I guess my closing thought is that those of you who believe capitalism is hopeless and want the revolution, I hope that you'll come to this book or to this idea or to this conversation and join the reform movement. Because I do think that those of us working within the system really at this particular point in time have a wonderful chance to elicit change that'll be for many, many generations. So I would suggest humbly that while revolution may ultimately be necessary, I think reform is possible. I think that we can bring spirituality to capitalism. I think we can bring spirituality to work. I think we should be proud of our religious heritages, whatever they are. And I think we shouldn't be shy to use spiritual language, whichever spiritual tradition we belong to in the public space. And thank you, Rup Shmoli, for having me and for having this discussion. I appreciate it. Yasha Koach, really, David, thank you for bringing these Jewish values into a very relevant, uh, uh, conversation that uh, is desperately needing the new frameworks. Uh, and you brought a number of models um, historically and from our Jewish value system that I think are, are very compelling. So thank you so much everyone for joining us. We can't wait to continue. Eddie, what's next? What's next here? Definitely. We, we, uh, we got the fellowship coming up as I, I wanted to remind everybody of that. And then next week we have a class as well. I'm going to be sending out an email to those of you who RSVP for today's class. You'll be getting another email to be able to join us for our next class next week. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, always follow, like, and share uh, all of our postings on social media. Professor David, this was incredible. I appreciate uh, your amazing knowledge that we had here. And, and conversations like these are just are, are what elevates our society is, is having these amazing conversations. Everybody have a great day.